Uh, welcome everybody um, to the Apazo, the webinar, the episode two, session four. And uh, today we have two distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Jacob George and also the, uh, the Professor Kudo. But before we start this webinar, we have the sad news. Uh, we have lost one of the giants in hepatology in Asia Pacific, and Professor D.S. Chen. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? Yes, Professor Chen is undoubtedly a distinguished pioneer in hepatology in the Pacific region. And he has done a lot of work in the initiating the vaccination for hepatitis B uh, in the world. And uh, we sadly have lost Professor Chen recently. Mm -hmm. And um, the next slide, please. Professor Chen initiated a lot of activities in our field and is one of our key members. And this photo was taken in 1999 when Apazo initiated the consensus uh, meetings in hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And you can see a lot of old friends and new friends in the pictures. And to this, I would like to ask the chairman of the steering committee of Apazo, Professor S.K. Sarain, to play a few words and uh, to lead our uh, tribute to the Professor D.S. Chen, Professor Sarain. Can we go to the first slide, please? Uh, Professor D.S. Chen, uh, very fondly called as D.S., uh, left us for his heavenly abode on uh, June 24th. And uh, he will be remembered for his seminal work in the world, not only Asia, on hepatitis B and bringing the hepatitis B vaccination and reduction in the HBV infectivity rates, liver cancer rates across the world. Not only Apostle, but everyone salutes him for that. I would like to pass a resolution on behalf of all those who have worked on liver disease to say that this brilliant, unassuming, most affectionate and most methodical scientist who worked till his last day to have a place in heaven and we pray that his legend that his work is always remembered and we would like to convey through this webinar to his family a deep sense of condolence and I feel as a person I and many of us have lost a very dear friend. I would like you to observe half a minute of silence in his memory and pray for the departed soul. Thank you all. I hand over to Professor George Lau to conduct today's sessions. May I have a Professor Fan to come in to moderate the first sessions? Professor Fan. Okay. It's my great honor to be co-chair the seminar with Professor 
uh, George Mio. Uh, the first speaker today is uh, Dr. Jacob George. He is a Robert Story Professor of Haptic Medicine at the Story Nevo Center, Westmeet Institute for Medical Research, University of Sydney, and head of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and West, Westmeet Hospital, and Director of Gastroenterology and Hepatology Service for the Western Sydney Local Health District. He undertakes basic and clinical research on metabolic associated fatty liver fibrosis and liver cancer. Uh, and also uh, the Journal of Hepatology and is on the editorial board of Hepatology, Hepatology Communications, Liver International and uh, the World Journal of Gastroenterology. He was a past executive council member and chair of research for Apostle um, and is current chair of the new faculty of the Gastroenterology Society of Australia. Today, uh, and he will speak, uh, speak on the metabolic associated fatty level, what's new. Professor Jacob George, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fan, for that nice introduction. And thank you particularly to the Executive Committee and Professor George Lau for inviting me to talk today. And as Shiv has already said, my sincere condolences uh, to the family of E.S. Chen, who I've met on several occasions. He truly was a join of hepatology in the world. What I've been asked to talk about in the next 20 minutes is what is new in the field of metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And I guess to put it very simply, in 2020, in the middle of all of this COVID uh, that we are seeing, is we've now developed a new conceptual framework about thinking about the commonest liver disease that we see and will be the commonest liver disease of the 21st century, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And by way of overview, I'm going to actually touch on five aspects. Firstly, just a single slide on the prevalence of fatty liver disease. Then I'll talk about problems with the old terminology. What was the process in coming up with a new name? and coming up with a new definition and how we can move from a concept to an algorithm and then really look at what the data is currently on the validity of the system for clinicians and then touch very briefly on the future. So this is my only slide talking about NAFL prevalence. And I guess this is a paper that we published with Zubay Yunossi in 2008. You can see the Areas in red are areas that have high MAFL prevalence greater than 30%. So the US, uh, parts of the Middle East, South Asia, parts of Southeast Asia and Australia. And what you can see in the pie diagram is the prevalence of the PNPLA3 genotype. And the, this slide is actually put to importantly demonstrate that, for example, if you look at a country like India, the prevalence of PNPLA3 is quite low. However, the prevalence of MAFL is quite high, suggesting that it is very important to think about the gene environment interaction when we talk about MAFL. So what are the problems with the old terminology talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? And there are basically five major problems, as I will illustrate. Firstly, the word NAFL does not capture the heterogeneity of the patient population that we see with regards to drivers and disease modifiers. In other words, NAFL is essentially a basket for when you exclude every other form of liver disease. And within that basket, we've got a heterogeneous group of, of people and within 
metabolic associated fatty liver disease also, there is more heterogeneity. And what that eventually results in is that it does not define an individual's phenotype precisely so that we can actually develop targeted therapies. And so what we know currently is that most of the drugs that we have either have failed or have a response rate above placebo of only 10 to 20 percent. And that importantly is because we're not actually phenotyping our patients very well and targeting our therapies to individuals with specific phenotypes. And a consequence of this is that currently the trial entry is based on histology. And histology only has steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis, and it's a basket definition. It's not based on the drivers of the disease. And this is a, a, a big reason for poor treatment responses and trial failure. From a patient perspective, the use of the word non or non-alcoholic trivializes the disease and discriminates against individuals. And finally, from a much more holistic perspective, thinking about people and patients, not just about their liver disease, what we need to do is to distance the disease we're talking about from pejorative terms such as alcohol or obesity. And we need to think about our disease more closely aligning with other metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of problems with the old terminology. The other aspect from a public health perspective is we all know that there is a lot of underfunding uh, for research and clinical practice on fatty liver disease. And the question is, is this negative impact partly related to the name? And this is a paper that was published this year by Jeffrey Lazarus from Barcelona. And he looked at a, a poll of 29 European countries and none of them had written strategies or action plans for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. NAFLD is not considered in any screening guidelines for diabetes or other related liver diseases. And we all know that liver disease is really underfunded across all countries compared to diseases that are classically and clearly identified as metabolic. So diabetes funding, cardiovascular funding, PKD or chronic kidney disease funding. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of promoting this disease amongst the funders and amongst patients. So what are the sources of heterogeneity that we capture under MAFL. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of factors that we need to consider. Age, sex, ethnicity, diet and alcohol. We need to think about the host. So the genetics and epigenetics of the person. We need to think about the world within, which is our microbiota. And then there's this very complex and very poorly defined and poorly articulated concept of metabolic health. And what we know is that all of these interact, which then results in different disease subtypes, variable natural histories, inter-individual variation, and variable responses to therapy. So Maffold, as a one umbrella term, is a very heterogeneous disease, and it's very different from say hepatitis C or hepatitis B, where there's one etiological agent, a virus, and in terms of treatment, we can go after the virus. Whereas in MAFLD, when you have all of these interacting factors, you can understand how complex it is to try and define a treatment that works for all people. And so we need to actually more clearly define over the next little while, the heterogeneity of this disease. So just to illustrate that for our audience, if you think about uh, three patients and you have environmental factors, so the environment outside, this concept of metabolic health, and for argument's sake, I've just put it as a, a Venn diagram of three with genetic predisposition. You could add to that the microbiota and other factors. But for example, in this patient, 
genetic predisposition and metabolic ill health may be a small cause for his liver dysfunction and his or her major cause for disease and disease progression might be environmental factors, whether it's a total lack of physical activity, eating fast foods or drinking excessive amounts of soft drink. And this contrasts with a patient on the other end, patient three, who basically is eating a healthy diet, he's being uh, very fit and physically active. Perhaps he's only got one component of the metabolic syndrome, but unfortunately that person has got a large genetic predisposition with multiple disease modifiers or epigenetic disease modifiers contributing to their disease. And you can see patient two will have another combination. So you can see that if you have such a heterogeneous disease, very different from viral hepatitis, you are going to get very different outcomes. And you can't think of tackling this disease unless you understand the heterogeneity and over time you are able to subphenotype these individuals. So what is the impact of this heterogeneity? So the first thing is in terms of animal models, we need to understand that there's no perfect animal model and there cannot be a perfect animal model despite what people say. And we need to use animal models to dissect the role of individual drivers. So for example, a high cholesterol diet may be a very good mimic for lean fatty liver disease. A high fat diet in an animal might be one that captures the pathogenesis of simple steatosis. Other genetic models may actually look at specific phenotypes, for example, the role of oxidants or antioxidants. Another impact of this heterogeneity is the significant impact on clinical trials that we are seeing every day. And so we know, all know that the response rates in clinical trials are suboptimal, 10 to 20% over placebo. And why is that? It's just because we've got this umbrella definition, anything that's non-alcoholic is lumped together. We're not classifying our patients clearly. And then if you put all comers and you give them one blunderbuss treatment, then you get very poor responses. How much more elegant would it be if we can classify individual patients on the phenotype of their disease, look at the main drivers and then target the drivers. And I predict that we would actually get much better responses to treatment. But what is the alternative? We need to go towards more targeted therapies for individual subgroups, and then we can actually talk about rational combination approaches. So in the earlier slide with patient one, two, and three, there might be different combinations of treatment that we would give for each of the different patients. So is NAFL the right name? As I mentioned, NAFLD currently is a diagnosis of exclusion. It only exists when other diseases are excluded. On the other hand, what we need to do is to diagnose it based on positive criteria. And if we can diagnose it on positive criteria, such as we do for hepatitis C, then we can very quickly realize that MAFLD can and does coexist with other liver diseases, and you'll have synergistic variable outcomes. So for example, if you had a patient just with hepatitis C with no metabolic syndrome components, then his disease trajectory and outcomes in response to treatment would be very different if that same patient had hepatitis C and MAFLD diagnosed on positive criteria. There's also the issue about the safe limit of alcohol. Currently, when we define NAFLD, we actually say that it's okay to drink two drinks for a man, sorry, three drinks for a man and two for a woman. And so we cannot actually dissect the individual contribution of alcohol to metabolic health because we're actually lumping two diseases together. Fourthly, there is a problem in the way we conceptually think currently of fatty liver disease. We think of it as simple steatosis, and steatohepatitis. And the question is, is this an appropriate dichotomy? And I would very strongly argue 
and it is a very inappropriate dichotomy. So just think about the patient that has an HbA1c and the diabetes, an HbA1c of 10. You can biopsy that patient today and you'll see good going NASH. Control their diabetes in three months and you get their HbA1c down to seven and you repeat that biopsy in three months, you will actually find simple fatty liver. So we need to accept that in this disease, there's a rapid bi-directional change, and this bi-directional change can be quite rapid and can switch from steatosis to steatohepatitis. And I think so this one-size-fits-all approach to phenotypes is quite inappropriate, and to base it on histology, which has only got about three distinguishing features, steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis. And when we think of what ES10 did with fibrosis, with hepatitis B and hepatitis C over the last couple of decades, when we talk about hepatitis C, we talk about the virus, we talk about the degree of inflammation, we talk about the degree of fibrosis, we accept that this can fluctuate. And I think we should be thinking about fatty liver disease, not just as a simple dichotomy with outcomes, but really a complex phenotype that comprises all of steatosis, steatohepatitis, and fibrosis. Currently in the world, we also have a significant problem with alcohol that is not able to be segregated or defined better with the current terminology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So in Australia, the country where I'm from, two thirds of patients are moderate drinkers. In fact, two thirds of the general population. The US is no different. Two thirds of the population drink moderate amounts of alcohol. India, China, and I would say most countries, we have a major problem with alcohol. And if you're drinking moderate amounts of alcohol or even small amounts of alcohol, the current NAFL definition does not allow you to segregate or split the two unless we have very positive criteria for defining MAFL. And we have some data like this. This is a Korean study, 60,000 patients. And this line here is at baseline. And they looked at the 60,000 patients in terms of the FIB4 and the NAFL fibrosis score. And light drinkers were people that were drinking one standard drink a day. And as you can see, these patients were followed up for five years. And you can see compared to baseline, the light drinkers had an increased risk of disease progression, both on FIB4 and on the NAFL fibrosis score. And similarly for moderate drinkers, which was more. So we are actually seeing more data suggesting that alcohol has a significant impact. And even in light drinkers that is not captured by the NAFL definition. So early last year, 2019, we actually proposed an opinion piece that we need to define and revisit the nomenclature for fatty liver diseases. And we suggested this conceptual framework. So NPFL stands for metabolic dysfunction predominant fatty liver, APFL, alcohol predominant fatty liver. And if you look at all our fatty liver patients, this is the MPFL group, and this is metabolic predominant, dysfunction predominant fatty liver with no alcohol. And this is the larger group, two thirds of our patients that are also consuming alcohol. Then you've got alcohol predominant fatty liver, where a small group of patients don't have any metabolic ill health. And then the larger group of patients that have concomitant metabolic ill health. And then you've got secondary causes of fatty liver. And so this was our first foray uh, with Arun Sanyal and Professor Eslam, who did most of the work to try and revisit this fatty liver nomenclature. And then we said, okay, it's important uh, based on the feedback we got that we need to come up with a name. A critical issue for us was, how do we bring about a name change? Now, the first problem that we had to tackle as physicians in a room never agree. And unfortunately, the problem is that often the loudest person in a room wins. 
And we wanted it to be truly a democratic process. And we said, okay, let's bring together experts from all continents, Asia, Europe, North and South America, Oceania, and the Middle East. And we said, let everyone have a say, and no one is able to say more than other people. And so none of the authors actually knew who the other authors were and where they came from. And then we undertook an electronic survey on REDCap, the Electronic Anonymous Data Capture. And in two iterations, we asked two questions. The first question was, what acronym would you suggest for NAFLD and NASH? And we left, left it open and we had more than, um, I think about 25 different suggestions. And then we took the, the top six, and even at this stage, none of the authors knew who the other authors would be. And we said, please vote on the top six choices. And so this is the international consensus panel, and uh, many in the audience were members of the panel. And I've just listed them in, um, um, in alphabetical order. And as you can see, Professor Sarin and several others from uh, Asia were involved in this, and it was a Delphi process. And the overwhelming support, and remember, you can't, you know, in anything, if you have a democratic process, everyone will not agree. But we were really quite surprised that 72% of the participants actually came down to one name. And what is that name? It is metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. And the dis Dysfunction is really a qualifier, and we said the disease should be termed metabolic associated fatty liver disease or MAFLD. So we also in that consensus document came up with some overarching principles and conceptual framework. So we said, and everyone agreed on this, that the nomenclature of MAFLD should be updated to MAFLD. We all agree that the diagnosis should be based on the presence of metabolic dysfunction, not the absence of other conditions such as alcohol. We said we need to appreciate and accept that MAFL can coexist and frequently does so with other liver diseases. We should remove reference to the term alcohol in the acronym. And we also needed to recognize that MAFL patients with a contribution from alcohol represent a large group and a very important group for further characterization. And all the participants agreed that this is a heterogeneous entity and that to move forward to more personalized treatments, we need better patient stratification, better consideration of stratification when we develop non-invasive tools and in clinical trial designs. And we said, in the future, we need to actually think of this as a whole landscape, and we need to develop uh, studies to actually define the la landscape and to define the subtypes of the disease. And then we said, uh, in a second paper that was published in the Journal of Hepatology just a month ago, so how do we precisely define MAFL in positive terms? And so what we came up with is this very simple algorithm. And the role of this algorithm was not thinking of academic minutiae. It was thinking about the physician in general practice all over the world. They want something that's easy, can be applicable to their patients. And we said, if you can come up with hepatic steatosis, whether it's by imaging, whether it's by blood biomarkers or scores, or liver histology, and obviously this will change over time on what's the gold standard, because this is, as I said, for the physician at the cold phase. And if you have overweight or obesity with the qualifier that this should be defined on ethnic specific cutoffs or type two diabetes according to international criteria, very easy to understand, then the patient has got MAFLD or metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And a third group, we knew that one in five people with fatty liver disease are lean or normal weight based on ethnic specific criteria. And we said, if you wanted to classify these people as methyl, they must have evidence of significant 
uh, metabolic risk abnormalities, at least two, and the criteria are listed here. And if you read the original publication, this wasn't, you know, to select two as opposed to one metabolic risk factor. This was actually done with a very painful literature search by Professor Eslam and looking at the cardiovascular and diabetes and CKD literature to come up with the requirement for at least two metabolic comorbidities. So you can see now we've got a very simple cold face definition for the disease. Now there were some caveats. What about maphyl cirrhosis? Because we all know that with cirrhosis, the typical histology, particularly fat, may disappear. And we said, rather than talking about cryptogenic cirrhosis, we should be able to positively define maphyl cirrhosis. If a patient has cirrhosis with or without steatosis, but they have past or present evidence of metabolic risk factors to diagnose the disease with one of the two criteria, documentation of maphyl on a previous biopsy or historical documentation of steatosis by hepatic imaging, being very cognizant that particularly with us and looking at previous documentation, we need to really ascertain the previous alcohol intake. And then we suggested that if we have a positive definition for maphyl, then there will be a lot of patients because maphyl is very overweight and obesity is very common you'll have dual etiology disease. And so dual etiology disease is disease that meets the criteria for MAFL plus one of the others, whether it's alcohol use disorder, uh, viral hepatitis, autoimmune disease or others. And people with dual etiology disease would have a very different phenotype and different outcomes and different progression than patients with MAFL diagnosed according to our criteria. We also suggested that we should not be using the term primary or secondary. So if you've got physiological health, the liver has very little fat in it, which means that any amount of significant steatosis in the liver more than 5%, by definition, must be secondary to a metabolic insult whether it's due to uh, medications, uh, celiac disease, starvation, total parenteral nutrition, or other undefined causes of liver disease. So we said, rather than talking about MAFL as primary and everything else as secondary, we should really have pre-classifications, which is MAFL, dual etiology liver disease, and the term alternate causes for liver disease to explain all the rest and we move away from primary or secondary. So does this criteria work? And the issue is that all of those three papers that I've highlighted, it's very conceptual and it's based on just thinking about the disease and coming up with a consensus. Does that definition actually work when we're looking at our patients? And so this is, I just want to show you two bits of data and remember that this, the first, the second paper in Journal of Hepatology was just published a month ago. And this is a real world data from the NHANES cohort published by Lynn and co-workers in Liver International. NHANES data, 13,000 patients from the US that had an ultrasound fatty liver, so you could diagnose it potentially and laboratory data. And you can see MAFLD was diagnosed in about 29% of patients and NAFLD, the O using the old basket definition was about 33%, as you would expect, because it's a basket definition, you will have more people. And then what you can see here is that compared to NAFL, our NAFL patients were older, had a higher BMI, higher metabolic comorbidities, diabetes and hypertension, insulin resistance, lipids and liver enzymes. The new definition MAFL is actually capturing patients that are going to have potentially liver-related outcomes and much better so than NAFL. And the authors concluded that the MAFL definition was definitely more practical for identifying patients with fatty liver disease at high risk of disease progression. And interestingly, when they looked at MAFL patients with alcohol consumption, 
they were younger than those without alcohol consumption. They were more likely to be male. They had less metabolic disorders, but because of the alcohol, perhaps, they had higher liver enzymes. Telling us two things, that maffled and maffled with alcohol are essentially two different diseases with different trajectories, and there are significant differences in terms of disease progression and liver enzymes. And you can see that, as you would expect, if you have the two diseases together, there are more cases of advanced fibrosis in maffled with alcohol consumption. And this is a paper that's just been uh, submitted and it's currently under review. And I thank uh, Professor uh, Kawaguchi for giving me uh, this slide. Um, and this is a, a group of 777 Japanese office workers. And they were diagnosed as having MAFL based on criteria. And this group had no alcohol consumption. And then excluded alcoholic liver disease, so zero alcohol consumption, viral hepatitis, and other diseases. And you can see when you look through using non-invasive scores for significant fibrosis, the MAFL criteria actually diagnosed 20% more of the patients we want to see in liver clinics. In other words, the people that are likely to progress. And it had a higher sensitivity of 94% and a negative predictive value of 95.6% compared to the old NAFL definition. So two very important real world data suggesting that the concept actually works in real life. Well, what does the general population of academics think about it? And so far, we know that there have been three Twitter polls, one by Hannes Hackstrom, and obviously it's only if you follow him that um, you might go on to his Twitter page. This is from the US, and this is from Nature Reviews Gastroenterology. And what you can see is that in every one of those studies, um, MAFLD actually wins. And particularly if you look at this last one, this is the, the Nature Reviews has a much wider readership. And you can see the overwhelming majority prefer the new term, MAFLD, as opposed to NAFLD. So just in my last three slides, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, you look at the changing spectrum of MAFL. The current definition, this is by Luca Valenti in an editorial to the papers. Currently, we're looking at MAFL at one end and alcoholic, alcohol-associated liver disease at the other. We're now in the new era thinking about metabolic-associated fatty liver disease. There's going to be this group here with pure metabolic associated fatty liver disease. You're going to have another group in between that we're finally saying does have dual etiology disease. Then there'll be a group with pure alcohol related liver disease. And one of the very novel aspects is that we are going to be finding a group of patients that don't have this metabolic dysfunction that have fatty liver, which will be a disease of fatty liver that we don't understand and perhaps we're going to find other reasons for fatty liver disease. Currently, we think about this ridiculous dichotomy of steatosis and steatohepatitis, not accepting that these, this is a very dynamic process. And we will be moving to looking at liver fat being lipotoxic, particularly when it's associated with, with um, metabolic dysfunction. And we're going to be thinking holistically about the liver, both in terms of fat, lipotoxicity, inflammation, and fibrosis. So the journey so far, as you can see back in 1845, this is another uh, uh, review of this whole concept uh, published in Liver International. Thomas Addison described fatty liver back in 1845. Ludwig back in, in 1980 talked about uh, steatohepatitis. Then we had classification systems with the, um, with the Brunt classification and the CRN classification. In the gastro paper, we moved from NAFL to NAFL in terms of the name, and we've now actually proposed some positive criteria. And so what does the future hold? So really we've gone from NAFL and a dichotomous definition We've ditched alcohol and we've accepted 
said, yes, they may coexist and we need to think about it separately. And we've now come to this concept uh, talking about MAFLD as the umbrella term. We've ditched the idea of steatohepatitis. And in the future, I think we're going to be subphenotyping our patients in, under the MAFLD uh, metabolic liver disease into diet related or diet predominant, alcohol predominant, microbiota predominant. We're going to characterize all of these factors of metabolic health and the interrelationships and we should have better therapies going into the future. But just in my summary slide, MAFL prevalence, as most of us know, in one in four and one in three people. There are numerous problems with the old terminology. We tried to come up with a name using a consensus process. We came up with a, hopefully, a workable definition, a concept and an algorithm that we think can be used by clinicians. And in terms of validity, we've already, within a month, got evidence of superiority in two papers. And I think overall, putting our disease firmly on the, um, in the group of other metabolic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, CKD and liver, as one umbrella group of metabolic diseases means that both for our patients and for research and for clinical trials and for funding, the future is very bright. Thank you very much. And just my only disclosure, I just wanted to say that a lot of the seminal work and a lot of the hard work uh, to do all of this well, would not have been possible with the help and devotion of my uh, colleague and um, uh, partner in crime, Professor Islam, who is a very keen and very active academic anthropologist. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, Professor Jacob George for your wonderful lecture with very um, new data about the rename of NFD uh, to MFD. I think it's very interesting and very important revolution of uh, the liver disease. We will discuss in the second uh, lecture, finishing the second uh, lecture. Maybe we move on the second lecture. Thank you again. Professor Miao. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Fan. This is really an excellent talk. Without undue delay, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker. May we have the slide, please? Uh, professor Masatusi Kudo, who is now the Professor and Chairman of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Kinder University Faculty of Medicine. Uh, professor Kudo is uh, certainly the, uh, a giant in the hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, uh, by being uh, uh, able to publish more than 900 papers and uh, with a very high uh, HI index of 83. Indeed, uh, Professor Kuda is the editor-in-chief of uh, liver cancer journals uh, with an impact factor of 5.9. And, uh, and uh, I would like to have uh, Professor Kuda to present to us uh, some of the updates on systemic therapy of hepatocellular carcinoma. Professor Kudo. You can see. We can we can see yeah, that. Okay. Very good, uh, Professor Kuda. We can see the slides and also you. Thank okay. You. <laughs> okay. And uh, I I, uh, I already told uh, first line agent Lembertin was approved in 2017 and also recently atezolizumab bevacizumab approved as a first line agent by FDA. And the second line agent, re, re, uh, after several uh, negative trials, regolapenib, carbozantin, and ramsimran was approved as a second line agent. And also, based on phase one, two trial, nivolumab, pembrolizumab were approved by FDA. And in some of the uh, Asian countries, nivolumab, pembrolizumab can be used. So we have now a seven agents, five targeted agents, and two immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these three are. Uh, uh, uh and first line agent. These three are second line agent. And uh, this, these uh, checkpoint inhibitor and uh, targeted agent, the, as you know, in COVID-19 pandemic era, the 
Abbas to the expert panel recommend that uh, among uninfected ACC patients who are on treatment, TK treatment may continue, but change of immunotherapy schedule to four to six weeks to reduce the hospital visit frequency. So from uh, two to three weeks, usually two to three weeks to extend four to six weeks. And uh, I'd like to talk about treatment strategy in intermediate stage CC. As you know, TACE is the only uh, uh, guideline recommended pre, uh, standard of care for intermediate stage HCC. However, intermediate stage HCC is a very heterogeneous disease in terms of uh, tumor burden and uh, <coughs> uh, liver function. Because survival benefits in patients treated with TACE highly depends on treatment response by TACE and also uh, preservation of liver function. This is very important in the uh, era of multi-targeted agents. And also Dr. Bruch himself stated in his review that uh, not all patients with intermediate stage CC can be considered for taste. The best candidates for taste are asymptomatic patients with a solitary or a limited multifocal ACC. That means uh, there is an unmet need for patients with high tumor burden. In other words, taste unsuitable patient or taste ineligible patient subpopulation, such as up to seven criteria out. So this is a accept, uh, accepted concept that uh, mm, taste uh, failure and the treatment strategy. At the point of taste failure, switching to the solapenib or targeted agents will prolong the overall survival than uh, repeating ineffective taste. Based on the two retrospective studies and the prospective optimist trial. And this is an accepted consensus. It's important uh, switching case to targeted agent once taste becomes refractory in this multi-targeted uh, agent era. And the next step will be definitely how to find out the patient's rate population who do not benefit from taste, which is taste unsuitable suppression, and whether they benefit from systemic therapy. So these are the uh, papers uh, which state the uh, changing the targeted agent will prolong the, uh, prolong the uh, patient's survival. However, when we take a closer look at the detail of liver function, al already the, at this point, at the time of taste refractory, already 20% to 32% are the child QB or C patients, which means it's too late to switch to targeted therapy from TACE, even right after TACE refractory in era of this sequential multi-targeted agents. So we conducted, in order to solve this uh, problem, a expert consensus meeting was held last year, uh, in, which was held in Japan, Hokkaido Sapporo, and the 12 expert panel uh, created a consensus paper, a changing paradigm for the treatment of intermediate stage HCC and published in liver cancer already. And the first question is, uh, what is the treatment concept for intermediate stage HCC? And the statement is uh, for intermediate stage HCC, preservation of liver function is an important as, as important as achieving the high ob objective response because the goal of treatment is to prolong OS. And another question, important question is what's taste ineligibility or unsuitable? Taste unsuitability is defined as each one of the following three clinical conditions that prevent a survival benefit from taste or conditions that taste is even harmful. Number one, unlikely to respond to, ta to taste which means taste, refract, uh, taste resistant tumor, such as confluent multinodular type or massive or infiltrated type or poorly differentiated HCC. Or number two, likely to develop taste failure or refractiveness. 
such as up to seven criteria outer modules. Number three, likely to become child QB or C after taste. Up to seven criteria out, especially by lower multifocal nodules and RB, modified RB grade to B. So the concept comes from this comparison, objective response rate in TACE in placebo arm of a well-designed phase three randomized control trial, which is a, a space trial, TACE two trial, or a brisk, brisk TA trial. The response rate, world standard response rate, in this is a placebo arm, so it's a 42 to 52%. However, Lambertin, objective response rate of Lambertin in reflect trial is 40.6%, which is a similar response rate to TACE. And the sub-analysis intermediate stage Lambertin response rate is 61%, uh, which is better than TACE. So Lambertin may apply to intermediate stage ACC. Another important concept is the effect on tumor vasculature by beta inhibitor, such as the sulafenib or valenbatinib. The abnormal tumor vas vasculature can be normalized by anti beta inhibitor, such as targeted agent, including lenbatinib. Micro vessel density, tumor uh, interstitial, interstitial pressure, and vascular permeability can be normalized. So drug delivery is improved. So initial treatment with Rembatinib improved taste efficacy. So we performed a, a proof of concept study. Uh, intermediate stage ACC patients who received Rembatinib or taste as initial treatment between two, 2006 to 2018, because this 2006, the phase two study of Rembatinib was studied in Japan. So and uh, beyond up to seven criteria, out patient, high tumor burden and the child view grade A patients, out of them, 30 patients treated by lenbatinib, more than six months was selected. And after one to two propensity score matching, 60 patients treated by TACE was uh, compared with the uh, with the lambatin treated patient. And uh, after matching these two groups, there is no uh, difference between the, uh, especially, especially the uh, size, number, and the uh, liver function, AFP level. And the response rate by lambatinib is much higher, 73% as compared with 33% by taste because it's not surprising. Uh, intermediate stage uh, response rate is 62%. So child QA, taste naive patients uh, are, is uh, very high response rate and uh, clinical benefit rate is, and the disease control rate is much higher than taste uh, treatment. And also in, in terms of liver, liver function deterioration, uh, determined by RB score. RB score was slightly decreased in lenbatinib arm during the treatment, but at the end of treatment, the RB score returned to the baseline level. However, in taste treatment, during the treatment, the RB score was decreased significantly than uh, uh, lenbatinib, and at the end of treatment, this uh, the liver function deterioration was irreversible. So, in that sense, liver function can be, be reserved by lambatinib. Um, and also PFS, progression-free survival, is much longer, 16 months in lambatinib-treated um, group and three months by taste-treated group. So, treatment response is much better in uh, lambatinib um, arm for high tumor burden intermediate stage, and also preservation of liver function, lenbatinib is better than taste. So the survival should be better uh, by in lenbatinib arm than taste group. So if this is confirmed, this is a proof of concept. And actually of the of OS of overall survival was better in lenbatinib arm 38 months as compared with 21 months 
in taste treated group hazard ratio 0.48. So the treatment, uh, lambotinib is still on treatment 14 cases and discontinued and two cases uh, uh, become complete response and the discontinued because of PD is 14%. Among them, 10 patients received taste after lambotinib and three achieved, three patients achieved complete response, seven patients achieved partial response, and two patients actually achieved, uh, received curative treatment, such as resection or ablation. So I'll show you some of cases, large tumor, 19 years old patients, so taste benefit was considered to be low. So we introduced lambotinib and uh, two months, three months later, it, the large tumor became necrotic. And uh, three months later, however, this, this red uh, show represents the arterial flow. The arterial vascularity disappeared, sent, uh, most of the part, most parts of the tumor, except peripheral, peripheral area. And uh, also 29 weeks after start of lambotinib, recurrence was found. So we in, uh, introduced super selective taste. So you can see most of the uh, tumor were necrotic. However, the periphery, the dense accumulation was observed. One week after Ripardo test, Ripardo is densely accumulated in the peri at the periphery and recurrent tumor. And these patients actually now cancer-free and drug-free. And uh, this is clinical course. Uh, three tumor marker, AFP pivka to AFPL3, are uh, all elevated. However, this patient, 90 years old, so uh, half dose, starting dose was four milligram and elevated to eight milligram. However, those reduction or interruption because of the um, hand hot skin reaction. After that, local recurrence was found and curative taste was performed. So these tumor marker become completely normal. And this patient, uh, as I said, complete response with Rambatin free. Another patient, 70 years old, 10 centimeter size. This is also the macroscopic classification is congruent to multinodular type, which is known to be very resistant to taste. So we introduced Rambatinib. Uh, and uh, this patient uh, response, partial response continued four years. So recurrence after, recurrence was found after lambotin treatment. So we performed super selective taste. And also this patient, dense accumulation of repair dough was, uh, was observed because, uh, because of the uh, uh, vessel was normalized, abnormal vessel was normalized and the drug delivery was very good. And also this patient cancer free and rendotin free for more than two years after this curative taste. And this is also the infiltrative type ACC it is a very resistance to taste. And but so we introduced rembotinib four weeks after rembotinib, you can see tumor shrink and the necrosis. And that and three months later, we performed super selective taste, as you can see. Then complete response with drug free was obtained seven months after the end of initiation. So in the past, or even there is a multifocal uh, biloba multifocal tumor, taste was introduced according to uh, according to a guideline. However, this is only palliative taste. So effect, efficacy is poor and the liver function is deteriorated irreversibly and the hypoxia inducible cytokine such as Bezos and G14-2 induce recurrence new, new lesion. However, if we start lambotinib first, the most of the tumor become a necrotic anti-tumor effect and normalized tumor vessel and improve the deli drug delivery. This improves efficacy of taste and the super selective taste is possible for remaining tumor. And uh, this by uh, lambotinib, uh, lambotinib induces inhibition of hypoxia inducible cytokine. So efficacy of taste is improved, liver function is maintained because of super selective 
case, and the BJF BNJ coefficient is not increased, resulting in recurrence new region will be suppressed. So oh, maybe the paradigm of treatment strategy in case uh, unsuitable intermediate stage HCC is changing drastically. Intermediate stage HCC with low tumor burden, maybe a super selective case with curative intent can be, uh, should be applied for this patient subgroup. And after case failure, systemic therapy should be introduced. However, intermediate stages with high tumor burden, systemic therapy should be uh, given before uh, local region therapy. And downstaging or best response is obtained, super selective case, or sometimes resection or ablation can be applied if downstaging is obtained. So super selective case can be achieved complete response or partial response uh, while preserving liver function. So why not introduce systemic therapy first for these patients of loop? For, for that reason, uh, clinical question 10, which treatment is recommended for taste unsuitable patients? Targeted therapy is recommended as the first choice in the first line treatment with subsequent selective local region therapy for taste unsuitable patients especially the drug that can have high objective response such as lambertine is preferred. So this is a new treatment option for intermediate stage HCC with high tumor burden, remb initial lambertine therapy with subsequent selective taste. If taste is suitable, of course super selective taste with curative intent should be performed and once it's refractory, systemic therapy should be introduced. However, it's it unsuitable uh, Lambertine or other system therapy should be introduced and followed by uh, super selective case. These are the new paradigm of uh, treatment strategy of intermediate stage HCC. By the way, the, the several uh, association published the COVID-19 pandemic, the how, how, how to treat the intermediate stage HCC like uh, either just taste should uh, state taste should be postponed whenever possible but ILCA uh, alternative therapy to taste is a systemic therapy. ILCA webinar also state our uh, data that uh, lambertine taste sequential therapy is recommended as a uh, first uh, uh, in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. And our, in Japan, from Japan, Japan Association of Molecular Target Therapy Working Group published this year that uh, all alternative therapy to taste is systemic therapy, lambertine preferred, followed by taste. And also, Apostle Expert Panel Consensus clearly says, for newly diagnosed ACC patient, trans uh, transplantation resection radiotherapy may be postponed. However, TKI and taste may be initiated. This is uh, consistent with uh, our, our uh, in Japanese um, statement. And I'd like to move on to the immunotherapy advanced ACC. As you know, the nivolumab and the uh, pembrolizumab was uh, were approved uh, based on the phase one, two study, but the phase three checkmate four, five, nine study was, uh, uh, tested seven forty total of seven hundred forty three patients were randomized one to two, one to one to Nibo or Solafeni. Primary endpoint was OS, but primary endpoint was uh, negative. OS Nibo could not show a survival benefit, uh, and the first nine months there is no separation, and the, of course there is a tail effect in Nibo and also there is a tail effect of of in sulafenib arm, probably because subsequent therapy after sulafenib, uh, immunotherapy was introduced around 30%. So median OS was uh, hazard ratio 0.85 and p-value was not significant. And Keynote 240 study, pembrolizumab as a second line agent, the Total of 413 patients were randomized 2 to 1 to Pembro or placebo. But 
this uh, trial also negative, oval survival. This clinical benefit was observed because pembrolizumab show a better uh, survival than placebo, hazard ratio 0.78, p-value 0.02. However, pre-specified pre p-value was 0.017 because alpha was split to interim analysis and co-primary endpoint of PFS. So this trial was clinically positive, but uh, statistically negative. So the, the pembrolizumab was not approved by FDA and other countries as well. How to improve the durable long-lasting response? Uh, James Allison already states that the durable long-lasting response can be obtained by immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor uh, monotherapy, in, but in few, few patients, some patients. But the uh, durable long-lasting response can be obtained in many patients by combining molecular targeted agent and immune checkpoint therapy. Because immune suppressive microenvironment is induced by VEGF, uh, product produced by tumor, and VEGF uh, stimulate tumor-associated macrophage or regulatory T cell or my myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cell all over suppressive microenvironment and also uh, inhibit the uh, maturation of DC or uh, NK uh, activation or T cell activation or T cell proliferation. So anti-BGF inhibitor uh, bevacizumab was improved the microenvironment from immune suppressive to immune permissive. So cancer MND cycle can be active by priming phase and uh, by normalizing the tumor vasculature. So recruitment to the T cell, to the uh, tumor cell, and uh, changing the microenvironment. And the PD-1, pd antibody is uh, very effective. So the, there is a phase 1b study of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab versus atezolizumab. This is a 1b study, but this is a uh, uh, conducted in order to confirm whether bevacizumab anti-BGF will actually improve PFS as compared with atez atezo alone by changing tumor microenvironment from immune suppressive to immune permissive. Additive or synergistic effect? We don't know, but the, the result was positive. The, the combination arm show a better PFS hazard ratio 0.55. Therefore, RMF, phase 1b RMF clearly showed bevacizumab actually enhanced the immunity to ACC by changing the tumor microenvironment. And this is a phase 3 in BRAVE 150 study, and a uh, uh, total of 501 patients randomized 2 to 1 to Atezo, Bevo, um, or Sorafenib. And uh, co primary endpoint OSPFS. And the uh, enrollment was very quick, 10 months. And the first interim analysis showed OS was positive. Uh, other than the median OS not reached, Serapin 13.2 months. And the hazard ratio 0.58. And PFS also show a hazard ratio of very good result, 5.9. And also uh, toxicity was much better than Serapin. And even no uh, immune-related adverse event or breeding events were reported and already, already published in New England Journal of Medicine. And also QOL was improved by atezolizumab combination arm. So uh, systemic therapy may uh, already FDA approved. So most of the country, uh, first choice of first line agent will be atezolizumab plus bevacizumab and followed by Remba or Spenpo. And the, this should be uh, effective, uh, efficacy will be ex expected because of, because different mode of action uh, from the checkpoint inhibitor. And the many sequence can be cons considered, especially the embatinib was already shown uh, effective after sorafenib or after regorafenib. So, and also, uh, uh, currently, there are many ongoing phase three trials in advanced stage, intermediate stage, early stage. IO monotherapy or IO-IO 
PD1 CTL combination, MRI checkpoint, or checkmate, or relief cells of two IOTK antivagic, cosmic travel, atezo cabo, and the uh, taste combination, many trials, four trials, and adjuvant setting, IO plus minus antivagic after operation RFA. And, uh, the old, and I only show one uh, leap zero two study, Pembro plus Renva. You can see the very good uh, response and the very few PD patient, only 7%, and PFS 9.3 months, and the median was 22 months. And they, this is also now a phase three deep zero two trial is ongoing. So I'd like to summarize my talk. We have currently seven or eight active agents for unreasonable ACC. It's too late to introduce targeted agents as a taste failure or refractiveness. Time has come uh, that some care for intermediate stage ACC is not only taste. OS in patients treated with Rambatin as initial treatment followed by selective taste was better than that in treated with taste alone as initial treatment in intermediate stage ACC, exceeding up to seven criteria and the child fuel liver function. New combination immunotherapy will change the clinical practice drastically. And currently, many other clinical trials of combination immunotherapy in all stages of ACC are ongoing. Thank you very much for your attention. Well. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kudo. This is an excellent talk, and uh, I congratulate also Professor Jacob George. I think we have uh, really a lot of information and excitement this afternoon. Uh, any questions uh, from uh, Professor Sarain? Uh, because uh, we are running out of time, and maybe we should have uh, one question from uh, our chairman of the steering committee who is with us. I think uh, on behalf of everyone, these were two outstanding lectures both by Professor George and Professor Kudo. I think uh, we will have many, many questions uh, which we will send over to you and the moderator will say, I learned a lot in personally. I have only one small question to Professor George and that is uh, the definition of NASH was brought in to have a very homogeneous group. And now uh, we may have, and I am party to it, we may have a lot of heterogeneous group. Uh, therefore, I think we need to work in next one or two years to have different categories uh, so that, and you rightly said, highly genetic and all that. So I think we will work more for defining the subgroup so clearly like, uh, you know, people, can go for therapy. I don't want an answer right now. I just gave you my thoughts because we are running over and I, f I go back to the moderator. Uh, thank you, George, for allowing me to speak. Yeah, Professor Jacob, George, uh, you want to uh, give the comments and then we will close the sessions. Yeah, look, I very much agree with Chip. I think this is the start of a whole lot of extra work. But I think we've got a conceptual framework which says now we need to do the hard work and all of us in the Asia Pacific, we see so many patients. We need to now sub phenotype the patients in any which way we can. Thank you, Dr. Professor George. And I'm, I'm sure the audience would like uh, both of you to be re-invited to give uh, our next talk. And uh, without undue delays, uh, I would like to close uh, the sessions for today. Thank you to everybody for attending this uh, webinar by a puzzle. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.